somewhere between this congestion I'm dealing with and the Word of God. We're going to say something up here. <laughs> something up here today. But uh, our text we're opening with this morning is Isaiah chapter 42. I just have to look down at Isaiah 43. Just the same opening, same page here. Same opening. Isaiah 43 verse 20 says, The beast of the field shall honor me. Y'all see that in verse 20? Well, the Bible says the beast of the field shall honor the Lord. The rock shall cry out if we don't. Mm -hmm. I just don't believe I want nature doing my job. You, I think yeah. I, you know, I, I don't want a beast doing my honor of the Lord. I'm going to do my own honor of the Lord, don't you? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. The beast got enough sense to honor the Lord. Surely we ought to have, haven't we? Glory to God. He said, because I give waters into the wilderness and rivers in the desert and give drink to my people and my children. <clears throat> uh, this people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Amen. Lord that's God. all we're here for, to praise the Lord. You know that's that? right. Amen. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. And thank God for the Word of God. Amen. The name of Jesus. I don't know. This world puts pressure on you. You want to frown. You want to cry. You want to just, you know, kick something. But, you know... The Word of God doesn't, this world changes. Everything about you is continually in, in the state of change. Yeah. But this Word doesn't change and God doesn't change. And if He was ever worth honor, if He was ever worth praise, He still is. You know that? doesn't matter what we feel like, what's going on. Because that stuff's going to just ebb and flow until Jesus comes. And the stronger you get in the Word and the stronger you get in faith, the less it, you know, mm -hmm. you know ebbs and flows. And just the graces and the goodness of God shows up and stays. But you know we are just continually have a mindset, at least that of the beast of the field, <laughs> yeah. be a mindset to honor the Lord and yeah. praise the Lord. Amen. He gave the beast water in the wilderness. Well, he's giving you and I water, and water in the Word, and water to, literal water to drink for that matter. And <clears throat> food to eat, and clothes to wear, and a house to live in. We stay warm, we stay dry, but you know, a lot of people don't have that. Amen. Yeah. But they could. Amen. If they just make a decision, Lord, I don't know where you're at, and I don't know what you're doing, but here I go, I'm going to find out. And you draw an eye to him, what's he going to do? Yeah. He's going to drive on, draw an eye to you. So Amen. people just make a decision to draw an eye to the Lord. Amen. They'll meet up directly. Yeah. That's right. Amen. When that happens, you'll move out from under that bridge. That's right. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. <clears throat> I think many times that, that bridge life and living in parks and out in the woods is a choice people make. And really, you know, that kind of leads into our message this morning. I hadn't thought about this text, but it kind of leads into our message. People get beat up. They just get beat up in one form or another. And they just want to withdraw and hide out, and they don't want to interact with nobody. And, uh, you know, they don't want nobody to see their hurts, and, and uh, they, just, they just become reclusive. They just hide out. Well, <clears throat> the Lord has an answer for that, and it's His presence in our life. Praise God. Hallelujah. That video that we watched on this first song, we sang it, it's all those pictures of Jesus holding broken people. Amen. Just embracing broken people. Amen. Uh, that's what he came to do, you know, that, to restore a uh, uh, purpose for living. Hallelujah. Amen. Anyway, <clears throat> we have this opening of Isaiah 43. Just one page to my left is Isaiah 42. The title of this message this morning is simply The Reed, R-E-E-D. Y'all know what a reed is? It's kind of like a great big willow. I don't, I don't, I don't what do they call it, called? Cat tail? What they, cat tails? I don't know what to call it. But a reed is, uh, I don't think they grow pretty large in some places, and they have various and sundry uses. Uh, but uh, this what text that we're looking at this morning is, is a reed is a type of people. And we're going to see why the Bible would say that. But, uh, uh, well, let's just let the Word do its own talking here for a little bit, okay? Isaiah chapter 42, <clears throat> verse 1 through 3. <clears throat> He said, Behold my servant whom I uphold, whom, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Anybody just want to take a guess who that's talking about? Yes, that's talking about Jesus. You know that it is. Yes. Verse 2, He shall not cry, nor lift up, or, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. The first time I read that, I thought, Lord, you, <laughs> something I'm missing here because he did a lot of lifting of his voice in the street. He did a lot of crying out to the people in the open air and out in the public arena. But it says he shall not do it. It's the leading and the unction and the direction of the Holy Ghost that he does it. Yeah. He didn't say nothing except what his father told him to do. Well, when God said do it, he did it. Yeah. 
That's right. Amen. He said he had no reputation. Well, he had a reputation, didn't he? I mean, another text you can find that. But it wasn't his rep reputation. It wasn't something he created. He's given all the glory to God, the Father. Amen. For him that work through him. Amen. He said, I can of myself do nothing. Did he not say that? Yes. But look at verse 3. We read all above just to get to verse 3. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment, uh, 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 bring forth judgment unto, the, unto truth. A bruised reed and smoking flax. we got to know that he's not really just talking about a reed and flax. Amen. Flax is what they used to make candle wicks with. I just, I don't know how they make the stuff, but they have lengths of it, as I understand. They'd cut it up, stick it in wax, and they'd just make a wick. And they'd light that, and, and the, the uh, olive oil, or whatever oil they had in the lamp, would soak up into that, and they'd just sit there and make a light in it, and sit there and burn it, make a light in the house. After a while, when the oil all burns up, the wick, uh, uh, the, the flame on the wick would begin to go out, and directly the light would go completely out. And all you got is a smoking wick. Filling the place up with smoke. Yes. People's lives fill a room with their smoke. I'm not talking about their cigarette or <laughs> tobacco, mm -hmm. but their character. You know, it brings a burning to the eyes sometimes. And it, uh, I mean, we're going to get into that thing just a little bit, little bit later here. But <clears throat> this is a bruised reed. Right? Back up with me to 2 Kings. It'll get a little more definitive about what a bruised reed actually is means. The other Bible would use that in, in context. Second Kings. Praise the living God. Well, the Lord is good, is He not? He comes to Him. He will be unblessed. He will be unblessed. Restore. The devil comes kill, steal, and destroy. Thank you, Lord. Oh, well, I, need, I said 18, didn't I? I mean, verse 14. Chapter 14. Chapter 18. <clears throat> I get my mind on one thing up here and just stop what I'm doing. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 20. In context, the king of Assyria sent a, two or three of his main dudes over there to Israel, over to Jerusalem, and said, uh, Give it up now, we're going to kill a whole bunch. We're going to just kill y'all, y'all surrender. And Rabshakeh, I think, is his name, and there's two or three others that are with him, but. Uh, uh, you can look at it in context and uh, Hezekiah, he was the king there and he said, no, we ain't giving up nothing and that, uh, I think he finally wound up buying his way out of it, I don't know what happened here all together, but this setting here, as you read this is in the time of Isaiah's ministry the prophet Isaiah the prophet Isaiah ministered like some 700 years before Christ, so we're looking about that time frame of 700 B.C. Uh, <clears throat> verse 20 this year, emissary of the king of, As of Assyria said, you say, uh, but, but, but they're, vain, they're vain words, what you say, they're just vain. I have counsel and strength for the Lord. Now whom do you, now whom do you, do, do you trust that rebellious against me? Talking about who, who are you going to put your trust in to, to rebel against the king of Assyria? Verse 21. Now behold, uh, you trust upon the staff of the bruised reed, even upon Egypt. What he was saying was, Hezekiah, you're trusting that Egypt's going to come up here and deliver you. And he called Egypt a bruised reed. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. The reason he called Egypt a bruised reed is because everybody still remembered that Exodus thing that happened over there. And by the time God got the Israelites out of Egypt, the, the, uh, the, the world power that Egypt was was totally decimated. Mm -hmm. All their wealth's gone. All their military machine is destroyed. And they're just reduced to a third world country. I mean, when the Israelites left, they were reduced to nothing. They didn't have a workforce. They didn't have a military. And they had no wealth. And they just done a bunch of houses in the desert. And they never recovered. Amen. Now, they are somewhat back to some measure of strength today as opposed to what they were then. But the king of Assyria, his emissary, Rebshika, whatever his name is, he's referring to them as a broken, bruised, weak nothing. That's what he calls a bruised reed. A, a nation that had strength that now has no strength. And he said, you're going to put your trust in them, come here and take care of you. But the point I wanted you to see is what he was calling a bruised reed, what Egypt was. Well, you don't have to think very long for what that was. I mean, like I say, they're reduced to nothing as far as strength and ability, ability goes. All right. <clears throat> Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. 
Let me just kind of catch up myself here. A bruised reed, my little paragraph thought. A bruised reed is a reed that has been crushed. Its outer stem structure has lost its supportability to stand up. I mean, they have a kind of like a cane stalk, a reed is, kind of got a stiff outer structure shell to it, and like a sugar cane stalk, you can break them, and you can't never get them to stand back up right again. They're bruised there. That area's crushed, and their, their ability to stand, their structure, uh, ability to stand is broken, and the least little thing, if you stand up, blows it right back over. Amen. That's the, way the, that's the condition of Egypt. Well, all of that paints a picture of, of what a lot of God's people look like, His covenant people look like. I mean, the, the devil's not been sitting around idly doing nothing. He's out there trying to break everything that he can. Break hearts, break bodies, break bank accounts, break your soul. And every time a crushing moment like that comes, it, you know, you're a little bit weaker than what you used to be. Amen. Until after a while, you just, if somebody don't come along and help you, you can't stand by yourself. You're just the least little pressure. You fall over. Y'all get the picture of what I'm talking about this morning. Amen. You have trouble standing on your own. And you can't fall over. Well, I mean, you, you fall over every time something, you know, a little pressure comes. Jesus came to restore us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. To put strength in our structure. Well, I don't know where that come from. Put strength in our structure. Amen. Give us the ability to stand. Why would he say having done all the stand? Stand because you can. Yes. You don't feel like it. I mean, if you've just left to your own ability and, and, and left to the way that the condition that the, that the enemy has created in our life, we can't stand. We're hurting. We're hurting inside. We've been rejected. We've been criticized and accused and abused. And I don't know what all, not to mention just the, you know, the, 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 the emotional wreck we've been made and the physical conditions we wind up in time to time. And, and we just get all messed up and we just want to be like <clears throat> uh, 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 a lot of people today. They just go hide out and they just want the world to leave them alone. They won't leave the world alone. Yeah. But God's got a life for you. Hallelujah. God has a life for you. He's got an ability for you to live a strong life. Amen. A strong and satisfied life. Yep. A long life. Hallelujah. Yeah, man. Praise God. We're not called to go through life all bent over and broken. No. no. Yet we're called reeds in the Bible. And if you crush one of them, it can't stand. Just the least wind comes through, the least breeze comes through, it just falls over. Amen. 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 That's right. Lord help us. <clears throat> People get bruised within and have, have trouble standing up under, under pressure. But that's what this relationship with Jesus is all about. Is to heal the brokenhearted. Yes. To heal the hurting. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and joy and peace and the Holy Ghost. If you run around that just a little bit, you start getting your start getting your reed fixed. <laughs> start getting your backbone fixed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about you're able to stand under pressure. The problem is we look at the pressure. We keep looking at the winds blowing. We keep looking at you know, how we're hurting and, and who hurt us. We keep looking focused on the, the negative side of things instead of looking at Jesus. Moses put that serpent upon that pole and, and, and he said, anybody gets bit by the fiery serpent, he said, if you'll just focus on that serpent, you'll get healed. People don't want to focus on the answer. They want, I mean, on the, the, the source of the answer. They just, want to, they just want the answer. They want to be able to sin and comfort what that amounts to. They want to be healthy and strong to go sin. Well, the Lord wants them to be healthy and strong, but He wants them free from their sin, deliver from their sin. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. We have trouble standing because we get crushed sometimes. Look at Romans chapter 5, <clears throat> New Testament. I'm trying to paint a picture here of what a bruised reed looks like. And it's talking about people. Where Egypt is concerned, it's talking about a nation. The Israelites left over there. When they did, they just cleaned the house. I mean, they took all their wealth, the whole military machine drowned in the Red Sea. And uh, they had no trained workforce to do anything. Nobody knew how to do anything. They just reduced to a third world country. Well, the Bible calls that a bruised reed, a dysfunctional country. Well, if there, <laughs> there's dysfunctional people. And the Lord offering all of humanity uh, a, a, a healing for that, a deliverance from that. Amen. Romans chapter 5, is that what I said? Mm -hmm. uh, verse 1, if I can find it. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You're about to say said, we have it. Well, I don't feel like I got it. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that. We have faith and peace with God if I feel like I got it. Yeah. That was, <laughs> it doesn't say if you feel like it. You believe that verse and feelings will show up directly. Yes, amen. If you believe it long enough and hard enough, direct your feet will move. 
Next thing you know, you're fixing to knock something over in your living room when you ran through the house. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 2, by whom we also, whom also we have access. Look at verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Y'all see that? Yes. And rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. His shed blood and the power of His cross gives you and I the ability to stand. A bruised reed can't stand because it's broken. But by faith we get that fixed. Yes. Amen. The structural ability to stand is restored regardless of what wind's blowing. Right. Amen? Yes. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Hallelujah. There was a statement made concerning John the Baptist. Jesus said it made it actually. Look at Matthew chapter 11. Glory to the living God. Sometimes we hurt. Sometimes we feel good. Sometimes we feel this and sometimes we feel something else. All that ebbs and flows and all that changes from time to time and from day to day. But the word of God is constant and it never changes. Amen. Our job is to get on that word and continually affirm and to continually declare, I am what this book says I am. The Bible says you and I are complete in Christ. Does it not say that? <clears throat> you found that in Colossians, I think it is. Well, if you're bruised and all broke up, you're not complete. But you keep looking at Jesus and you keep looking at the Word of God and direct your strength starts coming in. Amen. Healing and restoration starts developing. Yes. Yeah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I think, I think reeds are used to make... I mean, I'm not sure about that. I think they used to make uh, writing pens with <clears throat> at that time. And uh, they sharpened points on them, dip them in the ink, dip them in the ink, and they could write things with it. <clears throat> they, had, they had many different uses for them. <clears throat> but verse 7 in Matthew chapter 11. And as they departed, <clears throat> Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, <clears throat> What went you out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind. Y'all see that? John, <laughs> Jesus called Jesus. Uh, Jesus called John Reed. <clears throat> but you put a broken reed, just kidding. I mean, a reed is something that grows in a marshy area, in a, in a, in a, in a marshy area. <clears throat> but you get one of their stem, the structure of it is broken, as we said a while ago, and the wind blows, they just, the, 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 wherever it's crushed at, it just blows over at that point. But here he's calling John a reed, <clears throat> being moved by the wind. <clears throat> Which means he's, he wasn't crushed. He wasn't, I mean, it, 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 he stood strong. But the, the, the point's being made here, the Holy Ghost is moving him. The wind of heaven is moving, is blowing upon him, and he's been moved. And there's all kinds of things involved in that, I'm sure. <clears throat> but the Holy Spirit comes in mind in your life and, it, and blows upon you and I. In other words, he's, he, we're moved by him. Amen. And if you're crushed, you don't move like you're supposed to. You, you fall over instead of being, you know, used by him like he wants to use us. Yes. Okay? Y'all get that? Yes, yes amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. There's some people who go to church just to see what the Holy Ghost is going to do. Well, that's good to do that, you know. Right. You know the Holy Ghost may be wanting to blow up on your life yes. to use you. Yes. Thank you, Lord. And if we're sitting there all broken, I was in a church service one time, just, just bear my own soul here for just a little bit. <clears throat> you wouldn't think anybody as strong and powerful and mighty and, oh, just a man of great power and faith that I am would ever have a problem, but. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we all have problems. I'm sitting in a church service and uh, off up in Missouri one time, and uh, the pastor, he's full of joy. He's full of strength. There's no broken reed about him. I mean, he's strong, and he's a man of God, and he's a man of faith. And he said, let's just laugh. I'm sitting there so depressed out of my mind. I want to go down there and smite the pastor. <laughs> he's telling me to laugh. I don't want to laugh. I ain't going to laugh. And then you got to, you got to, Kind of, I don't know, chastising them that didn't laugh. Well, I already felt bad enough. Now I feel real bad. <laughs> but that brokenness on the inside of you will cause you to just withdraw into yourself. And so after a while, you're just a shell of something sitting there that's not of much value to anybody, you know. <clears throat> but this text here we're looking at, it says that John was a reed shaken by the wind. And Jesus is saying, what do y'all do? Just go out there and just see how, just go out there and see the show? Hallelujah. 
He goes on to say, But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's, king's houses. That's when we wear soft clothing. We're kings. Amen. Amen. We live in a king's house. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise God. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yeah, he said, I'm much more than a prophet. And he began to talk about John's ministry. <clears throat> He's talking about John standing and being used of the Holy Spirit of God in his time. Bruised reeds can't do that. A broken reed just falls over when wind blows. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Glory to God. A bruised reed just blows over when the adversities of life and the ill winds of life blow. <clears throat> These bruises that we're talking about comes from a from, have their origin in rejection. I mean, the Israelites rejected Egypt, did they not? Mm -hmm. It become apparent that God's on their side, and God rejected Egypt. Yeah. Messed up the whole mindset. You know it had to. <clears throat> the Israelites began to bury their own firstborn. I mean, uh, you can imagine what a mess that was. <coughs> not to mention all them dead frogs, and, uh, and all the cattle dead, and all the crops destroyed. I mean, that place was a mess. Amen. Hallelujah. And the sense of rejection, of being rejected by, by you know, their, their own leaders, and then suddenly it becomes obvious to him that heaven has rejected him. And it brought about a bruise in, in, in the lives of those, of those people. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Go in Matthew. See, we're in Matthew. Are we not? Uh, hmm, God. Well, Matthew chapter 12. Same opening. Act on the page over my Bible. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. <clears throat> Did I say 1214? Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to make this happen. <laughs> Glory to God. Good Lord. Yeah. Verse 14, Matthew chapter 5. Then the, then the Pharisees went out and they held a council against Jesus how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them. Heal them all. He knew the counsel of the Pharisees was to destroy him, but it didn't phase him. In that same text over there in Isaiah chapter 42, I think it is, you keep reading, it says he was never, dis Jesus was never discouraged. Have you ever been discouraged? Well, you don't have to answer that. But it shows up every now and then. And it's all part of that bruising thing that comes into people's lives. And even that stem stems out of rejection. Well, you know he's rejected by the counsel of the Pharisees. There was a, you have to know that had to touch him. Here, this religious hierarchy, the structure of the of the, of, of the nation of Israel, has rejected him. You know that didn't, you know, give him a warm feeling. But he didn't let that stop him, and he didn't let that discourage him. He left that place of rejection and went and held a successful healing campaign. Yes. Campaign, did he not? Yes. Great multitudes fought, and he healed them all. In verse 16, he charged them that they should not make him known. Verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. That's just you know, almost word for word what we read over in Isaiah. Oil. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. Well, that's where he was at in the streets when he healed. But it wasn't his voice they were hearing. It was his voice in the sense that it's coming out of him, but it's coming from the Almighty God. It's coming from the Spirit of God. <clears throat> Verse 20, a bruised reed shall he not break. A smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory. There are people so bruised and so hurting and they're just balled up in their bedrooms and painted the walls black and pulled the shades. We saw on the video this morning in our music, there are people sitting on the sidewalks and they're, you know, their head between their knees and they're just crying and broken. They're hurting and they're bruised. What we just read was Jesus said, I will not reject them. I will not refuse them. Thank you, Jesus. A bruised reed shall I not break. Hallelujah. I mean, religion, I'll tell you what, if you can't have no, if you can't live no better than that, well, get out of here. We don't want you in our house. They come in all doped up and messed up and all kinds of things wrong with them. And there's some churches and some religious organizations and a lot of people's families that will just get out and leave me alone. I don't have nothing to do with you. Well, what they do? They, they're already broken. And now they're broke, sure enough, because those that should have loved them and those that should have accepted them and those that should have helped them kicked them out. Jesus said, I'll never do that. 
all your brokenness. The Bible is telling you tonight. Jesus is saying to all humanity, bring all your brokenness to me. Bring all your hurt to me. Bring all your needle tracks in your arm. Bring them to me. Bring, bring all your crazy messed up insides. Bring them to me, he said. There's where it gets fixed. Amen. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench. <clears throat> uh, rather than just throw the lamp and the smoking wick out the door, why don't we just fill it back up with oil and refire that thing up and get some light coming out of it? Amen. Amen. Yes. Instead of just letting the thing burn there and the smoke yeah. fill the room where you can't see nothing, your eyes are burning. <laughs> And the smoking and the burning of the eyes is worse than the darkness itself. Yeah. Hallelujah. The Lord is not desiring to reject anybody because of all their bruised and brokenness. If Egypt will repent, my, what a revival to pull off there. And there is a revival going on in Egypt. I mean, all over the world for that matter. <clears throat> and anybody who feels like their light has gone out, any minister, any child of God, who feels like that they're just so messed up and they've done so much wrong over the years and they've just so failed so many times and their oil is all consumed and they have no fire left. The Lord is saying, come on, we can get some new oil, we can get you fired back up. Amen. Bless God. He's not ready to throw the lamp out. No. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. Bless God. If he's in the lamp throwing out business, I wouldn't be standing here today. No. <laughs> I've been throwing out a long time but so of the rest of us. Amen? Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Mm -hmm. He's in the restoration business. He's in the business of restoring people. Putting strength back in people's lives. Putting purpose for living back in people's lives. Amen. Healing our bodies. Glory to God. <clears throat> God. Glory to God. Verse 21, In His name shall the Gentiles trust. Well, if there's anybody messed up, it was the Gentiles at that time because they had no Bible. They had no God. They had no... They had no... Uh, uh, grace and mercy from heaven in their lives. It's all over there in Israel where, where God was working at this time. But he's saying now everybody in the whole planet, Jew, Gentile, I don't know, pagan or whatever you are, it doesn't matter what you are. If you're a human being and you're sucking air, he said, come to me. Just bring your body to me. Bring your spirit and soul and body to me. What did he say? Uh, 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 come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. All you who are laboring and operating under a burden of one kind or another. Just bring your broke up self and come to me. Amen. The Bible says God delights in mercy. Amen. Just tickles the Lord to find somebody that he can have compassion on. That's why the Lord really likes me. <laughs> Amen. Bless God. I give him a lot of opportunities to be merciful. <laughs> Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Reed shaken by the wind. Where John's life was concerned. <clears throat> well, the Lord wants you to be a reed moved by the wind. Hallelujah. I'm sure there's other things that's involved that I need to do a little more time studying the history of how reeds were used at that time. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. This, this bruised reed and this smoking flax is not rejected by Him. Mankind will reject you. If you don't look this right, sound this right, smell this right, I don't know, talk this right, act this right, and right in their mind is them. They're trying to recreate the world in their image. Right with God is, do you have a heart beating in your chest? <laughs> uh, that's all the right God needs. Just bring that to Him. Yes. Amen. Whatever else is going on around that beating heart, He'll accept it. You know, we've said this so many times in days gone by. The Lord make us fishers of men. He's, he's, a, he's the fisherman. He wants to make the rest of us fishers of men. And we've said so many times, you cannot clean the fish until you catch it. How silly would that be? How silly does that even, you know, the picture that it paints, to dive into a hole of water, catch a fish, and clean that thing up while it's down in the bottom of that hole of water. Mm -hmm. How long can you hold your breath that long? <laughs> I guess you could get you some oxygen tanks, maybe, I don't know. But you don't clean fish until you get them, you know, caught. <clears throat> well, the Lord said, bring all your messed up life. Bring all your messed up, broken self to Him. And he and the whole the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in your life begins to clean up what's wrong. Amen. Until after a while, instead of breaking in and stealing and selling everything you got and stealing so much, never you know other people had to come up with money to buy drugs and dope. The 
desire for it will be taken from you. Until after a while, you just want to raise your hands and say glory to God. You just want to lift your heart and your head and say praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And you just want to, oh, you just fall in love with God and you fall in love with Jesus and you're just excited about what he's done for you because you know he's delivered you from the heavy hand of the devil who's trying to destroy you with drugs and alcohol and stuff like that. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Look at John chapter 6. We're talking about a bruise reading smoking flax this morning. In some measure, I'm sure we will not have communicated everything that's involved in that. Maybe I can get you started to do your own study. Might have to do some history books of one kind or another to see how reeds were used at the time. And uh, if you're a broken reed, you become greatly hindered in your ability to be used. And the Lord is basically saying, I don't care how well you're able to be used, just bring your brokenness to me. Amen. And he'll fix it. John chapter 6, verse 37. Does your Bible have a John 6, 37? Amen. All the Father hath given me shall come to me. And him that come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Thank you, Jesus. Praise our Lord. All your brokenness, all your messed up self. He'll in no wise cast you out. Many have read that and said, well, all that comes to the Lord cannot be lost. No, that says he'll not throw you out. You can choose to leave if you want to. But it ain't him running you out. It ain't him running me out. Many people have come to the house of God, come to the heart of, and the hand of God, and come for salvation, and even born again. And somewhere another stuff got messed up again in their life, and they made the decision that they liked the darkness of this world rather than the light of heaven. Because Jesus said they love darkness more than light. And they just left. Went right back into the world they came out of. <clears throat> Foolish for doing so. But some have done that. But the Lord said, if you leave, it ain't me casting you out. Hallelujah. Sad to say there's some churches cast people out. Well, the Bible, is, there, there are guidelines in some instances where churches are supposed to tell people to leave the church. If they don't want to bring. If there's somebody that's a notable individual in a church, and they're living in an adulterous lifestyle, a drug culture in their home, and they're not willing to repent, they're not willing to leave that, Paul said, hey, you need to, you know, take them people aside and say, listen, if you don't repent, if you don't stop that, you know, you're going to have to go back outside and come back in again. Because he said, a little leaven will the whole lump. The whole community knows who you are. The whole community knows the church, knows the pastor, knows what's going on there. But they know they got this thing going on in the church at the same time. Yeah. Well, they already think we're hypocrites. So if they know there's a bunch of adultery going on in people's private life, or, or some other crazy sin of one kind or another, Paul said that needs to be separated from you. Amen. Amen. And the whole purpose of that separation is not to just completely discard them. Get, it's, it's to create a, 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 he says, actually to create a shame in them. So that they'll feel you know, remorse and want to repent and come back. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Psalm 27 speaks into the thought somewhat this morning. There's a song that we sing a lot in churches, and it's Where Could I Go But to the Lord? Do you remember that song? Sometimes this world will just push you down and push you down and push you down. I don't know at the time, man, now we've. I don't know at the time I'm going to face situations in life. <clears throat> and I'll turn around and turn and say, well, we're back in the dirt again. Because we built foundations of one kind or another and we built structures and we built this and built that only to have it taken from us. And uh, we've got to go back into the dirt and dig another ditch and start all over. Well, there's some people that, well, you get tired of being drove back into the dirt. You get tired of being driven back into the found, you know, building some kind of foundation again. <clears throat> And many people, they just go there and just stay. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. And then they go to thinking about how can I get it fixed? And, and as the song says, where can I go but to the Lord? So you just turn your eyes back to Jesus. <clears throat> you get on your face, you get on your knees, you just lay in front of the Lord and you cry a little bit and praise the Lord. And mm -hmm. 
until after all the strength starts coming back into your body. Amen. Amen. Coming back into your soul. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's go. I don't know if y'all have noticed this or not, but it isn't every devil in the world that's happy about you being here. <laughs> they told us in Bible school that the devil really don't mind you going to heaven. They'd rather, if they can't get you to just change and come back over to the dark side, they'd rather you just die and went on to heaven to get out of their way. Well, we're not going to get out of the way. We're the devil's problem. We're going to stay here and be that until Jesus says something else. Amen. 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 Yes. Glory to God. Yeah, you found Psalms 27 yet? Amen. Amen. Well, I'm in Psalm 42, which means I ain't in Psalm 27. Psalm 27, verse 9. Verse 9, verse 9. Uh, the psalmist says, Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Evidently, David had done something to draw the wrath of God. Well, you know that Bathsheba thing and the killing of her husband. And, and I'm sure that probably the only thing David ever did wrong. One place, one time David said, he said, my iniquities are so many I can't even lift my head toward heaven. Mm -hmm. And so out of this sense of remorse of, of, of situations like that, he said, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. Verse 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Y'all see that? Yes. You know where bruises come from? I mean, the number one place to get bruised is bruises that get there for life, unless you, you know, some kind of help from God to get it out of it, is in the home you grew up in. Amen. I mean, the place where there should have been love and acceptance and some kind of mercy in your failures should have been the home. Amen. But the very ones that's supposed to help you in your time of hurting are hurt themselves, and they don't know how to be a benefit to you or to help you. And so you get, you know, one dysfunctional home after another. You know, rejection feeds upon itself. and Rejection creates more rejection. Until that all, you know, until some miracle of God comes into your life to get that peace of God restored, the grace of God restored into life. Yeah. And only the presence of God can do that. You know that? Yeah. There's other people who can stand and talk to you all day long about what a great person you are. But on the inside, they're thinking, well, you don't know what I've been through. But God does know what you've been through. The Holy Ghost knows what you've been through. Yes. Amen. And He still says, just bring your package to me. Bring your tears and your hurt and your sorrow to me. Amen. Not me, but to Him. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. Amen. When my, mom, when my father and mother forsake me, what does a parent forsake in a child? What does that do to a child? There's a minister over in India. I forget what his name is now. But they had so many discarded babies in the community. Where, I mean, they just, they're, they're, they're deformed. There are all kinds of problems with children. And then the parents who have children, they just don't want children. And he's seen these babies just being killed and destroyed. And they're just thrown out on the street and they starve to death. And, and so he built a little room on the side of his house. Just a little teeny room, the size of a phone booth. And it had a door inside that, just a pull-out door. It pulls down and pushes back up. And it put a little bell in there, or a string to pull a bell, where parents could bring that baby, go in there and open that little door, lay that baby in there, shut it back, and ring the bell. Mm -hmm. And he knew somebody put a baby. He said, he said you know, he thought, he said, he saved them little babies. Because they were so rejected, so unwanted. Probably the only plus in the whole column of that whole thing is that little guys are too young to know they're rejected. Mm -hmm. And he just figured there might be one or two in the community to do that. He wound up with 600 babies in his house. Wow. 600 little infants. Wow. So that, that little bell started ringing and it just kept ringing. Word got out. Hey, if you don't like that baby, take it over and put it in that little drawer and said, them people take care of it. Well, he did. And he loved them back to health and he loved them back to, to strength and he and he put love into them. Yeah. Even though they had all kinds of things that were wrong in their life, but they knew they were wanted. Amen. They, knew they were loved. Hallelujah. <clears throat> when father and mother forsake me, yeah. there's where the pain and the bruise comes into a lot of people's lives because they know their, their parents didn't want them. Like I say, when babies are 
rejected by the home and they're too young to understand. <coughs> they really don't have that sense of rejection because they never experienced it to begin with. They never knew. All they knew was that hand that got a hold of them and pulled them into that, that little drawer they were put in. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But that's a bruised reed in verse 10. Y'all see that? Yeah. Glory to God. Psalm 69 says something concerning it. Glory to the King. Glory to Jesus. Thank God. <laughs> you know, we're all born into this world. Stuff got all messed up. But you know the good news is you can be born again. Amen. If you don't like the way things started out, hey, get born again and get started all over. By somebody who will in no wise cast you out. They'll not reject you. Psalm 69, verse 6, in my copy of the book, says these words, Let not them that wait upon on the O Lord God of hosts be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach. Shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. You know what that verse is saying? <laughs> Home life. His mother's children. That is the brothers and sisters. A uh, stranger unto my brethren. This is a testimony, I mean a prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus about his whole family rejecting him. They made fun of him. They thought he was crazy. We grew up with you. We know who your mother is. Same mother we got. You're saying you're God. You're nuts. And that rejection was continually hitting him right in the face. But this presence of the Almighty was with the Lord Jesus. Amen. This presence of the living God was with him. And, and glory to God, this, this same Emmanuel, God with us, came into our life. <laughs> they probably going to call you nuts. Or maybe already have. But that's all right. We know who we are. Jesus is born. So Jesus had this rejection in the home that he grew up in. He says, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that approached thee fell on me. My life was just one reproach, you know, reproach to God. And the Lord took the stuff that I was all messed up with and laid that on Jesus, and he went ahead and he claimed and accepted me. Just the same way he did you. Jesus took my sin. He took my bad and gave me his good. Amen? Amen. But you see that rejection thing in verse, what I want you to see was that rejection thing in verse 8. That's where bruises are created. And if you focus on them bruises, if you focus on the rejection and the hurt from people that should be loving you, that bruise will just get worse. We're not talking about, not talking about a blue spot on your flesh. We're talking about a blue spot on your spirit, a blue spot on your soul. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Isaiah 49, we're just kind of jumping around the book quite a bit this morning, but it's all right. The scriptures we need to look at. 49th chapter of Isaiah. I try to keep messages in chronological order, like start over in the Old Testament and just progressively go to the right to the New Testament, but sometimes you <coughs> kind of have to bounce around and get the thought we want. Isaiah 49, verse 15. It says, can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, though they may forget, and they do. They do forget. Today they forget to the point where they're selling the baby just for the money out of the body parts. How crazy is that? That they should have compassion on the son of her womb. Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. If you knew that your mother had just purposely abandoned you and forgotten you, what would that do to your insides? What would that do to your soul and your spirit? It just wrecks things in there. But God said, come to me. Just, just come to me. He said, behold, I've graven thee upon the palm of my hands. Thy walls are continuing before me. That's, that's the love of God. That's the mercies of God. And if you'll come to God, anybody that's broken like that and rejected by people that should have lived, if you'll come to God, the Bible says God sets the solitary in families. Amen. He'll find, a, he'll find a church for you. He'll find a family for you. He'll find a body of people who will surround you with their love and their compassion. 
He'll surround you. He'll, he'll, he'll lead you to a body of people who will put their arms around you and put their love around you and they'll accept you and embrace you. It don't matter what you are, who you are, or how you are. Hallelujah. If you're a human being, I don't care if you're black, white, polka dot. It don't make any difference. Amen. Amen. God made all of mankind of one blood, did he not? Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Rejection is a horrible thing. It causes bruises and you just just cripples people. It just makes you so ineffective in your own in personal life, in your home life, in your community, and on your on the, on the, on the, where you work at. Because those bruises in there has kind of got you so bound up. But the Lord has peace for you, for every one of us. Back in Matthew chapter 10, we should have went there a while ago, I guess, but uh, go to Matthew chapter 10. Amen. It's it's just you don't you don't know the you don't know the, the hurt that's covered up in people's hearts. And they got a facade at you, they got just layers of stuff trying to cover that up so you can't see it. Well just for for instance what I'm trying to communicate right here. There was a lady one time. I was uh, driving a truck, and I was going up 65 highway. I don't know where I was going. It was way at night, blue cold, ice everywhere, and snow. Yeah. Cars wrecked all over the place. And I come up around this curve here, and this Volkswagen actually is up on this bank, a snow bank, where the snow plows had just plowed it up. And, and, and she slid out of the road and up on that bank, and, and uh, of course, you know what that did to any lady's mind normally. They, they're all nervous about the whole thing, you know. But, uh, I got there and there's another driver, he showed up back there and he's slick and I said, well, we just got a whole thing pulled it back out in the road. <laughs> and uh, just got it back out in the road. And I just tried to put a little humor into it, kind of cheer up a little bit. And I said, now these things run a whole lot better than if you stay out here. <laughs> <laughs> Made perfect sense to me. <laughs> yeah. But you know, there's people, she interpreted that as a criticism. And I just got one roll of cussing out of it. I'm telling you, she, oh just, she just, and I, I mean, I've I just found out the hard way in life that you need to really assess the best you can the character that you're dealing with. And instead of just being your own Newton County self, you need to <laughs> work with them here somehow. Or another. Not, you don't know what's going to offend people. Amen. I mean, I'm not out to, to, to offend nobody. But nope. Somehow she didn't take that as. Any comfort at all when I made that statement. <laughs> I said, this is probably a lot better if you in the road. Well, that's what she was trying to do, start with staying in the road, and that ice got out. You know, she got, got out of control. Anyway, Matthew chapter 10, verse 21. Glory to God. The brother shall deliver up the brother to death. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. The brother shall deliver up brother to death, and the father the child. Can you imagine what that did to that child's heart? And what the brother's attitude toward one another has done? I'm not wanted. I'm of no value. I'm not loved. Who? Nobody cares. What does that do to anybody's insides when they do something like that to you? The children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Well, that time's come. It's already happened in many places over the years. It's going to really get bad during this tribulation time. Yeah. Verse 22, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. That's one reason why we need to get our bruises fixed. Amen. Because it robs you of your ability to endure. <clears throat> People keep gouging on that bruise and gouging on that bruise. So after a while, you just say, I'm out of here. I don't need this. And you just go find you a cave in the woods and live off of gray squirrels and pokes out of it. <laughs> I'm sure it didn't ever be in the world. <laughs> that video knows what folks have it. But anyway. Hallelujah. Drop one down to verse 36, <clears throat> same chapter. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. <clears throat> the 
we're talking about what happens to the, to not, not their blood pump, but the heart of a man, their, their spirit, their insides growing up. Such horrible bruises can take place in there until after a while. You know, that's what creates serial killers. And a whole lot of other stuff. And it all starts because of rejection in the home. But it's not just the home. Uh, I've got a little list of things here somewhere now. Uh, bruises are created in people's lives, certainly in the home, probably more than anywhere else. But in, in, in churches, I know, I know a family today. I think it's kind of changing now a little bit, slowly, but I've been praying for them and other people have been talking to them. But uh, they've not been in church in 40 years. Wow. And the reason they quit church is because some in that church said something that hurt them. Well, they just got saved. They just tender, young. They just, I don't know, they don't know nothing about nothing. All of a sudden, somebody that's been in the church for a while made some kind of crazy remark, and they were hurt. They were hurt by it. And they said, well, forget this. And they did. They've been back in 40 years. They raised a, a large family that won't go to church. Mm. I mean, they get back and give you a cousin if you bring it up. I mean, they're, they're, they're children. They're not the, the mom and dad of the family, they're kind of, I'm seeing some things change in their lives, but anyway, the home is the number one place where bruises are created, where this bruise read thing is developed. The church is another place in schools. You just let a child be bullied enough. It was just, I read it on the internet the other day with this young girl. They moved from town to town just trying to get away from it, trying to get away from it. And everywhere she went, she's a beautiful young girl, like 12, 13 years old, something like that. And, and just everywhere they went, where that was, I don't know, some devil dog in her track somehow. Doesn't it just went on and on from town to town to town to finally she just went in the back room, got her a rope and hung herself. Because of the hurt that was on the inside of them. Mm -hmm. She just couldn't take no more. She left a note. She said, for those of you raising children and you don't know what this does to the insides of somebody, this bullying and this rejection and this slanderous and hateful word does to a child, just so you'll know, I can't, I can't take no more. And she just hung herself, killed herself. Mm -hmm. The workplace is another place that bruises are created. Certainly the battlefields of wartime. Man, there were some tough ones to get out. There's, a, there's an old gentleman out here at Harrison. I, I don't know if he's still alive there or not. It's been four or five years, maybe longer than that ago since I talked, spoke to him. I didn't know the fellow. I just knew somebody else that did know him. Kind of threw them, got to talking to him. <clears throat> I get to want to know more about war than I should. If I want to learn war, I need to go hunt me up a history book or something instead of trying to dig it out of somebody's heart. And this gentleman, I was sitting in my pickup, and he just standing out. He's about 70 some odd year old at that time, but he'd been through that World War II. And I just started asking questions. Couldn't tell there's a thing in the world wrong with his answers. Until directly I asked one question too many. And he just exploded. Tears. He just went to crying and hollering. And as fast as a 72 year old can run, mm. went out across this parking lot. Hollering. Because all of a sudden, he's back there in that war. There's one particular battle that, that, that another person, not this one, but another one was in. He said that you couldn't walk, you couldn't put your foot on solid ground. So many dead bodies. You walked on bodies to get, try to get somewhere or another because there's just dead people everywhere. A human being, a human being was never tended to experience anything like that. No. We're talking about a reed being bruised, and well, that's where they, I mean, that's where you get, that's where you get it at. And just be perfectly normal, and uh, you don't know the hurts going in, going on inside people. When I was driving American Freightways, uh, they had fuel uh, bays at each one of these major hub, major terminals, <coughs> and the drivers running out of these here fuel bays and fuel fuel and well, there's two or three places over a couple, three trucks at a time can pull in there and fuel the trucks up. And you get to talk. We stand there fueling our tanks up. You just stand there doing nothing. And you get to talking to one another. And, and one of them, he, he, he'd been to Vietnam. And I knew he'd been to Vietnam. <clears throat> well, I wasn't really talking about the war, bringing up anything about war. But there was something I said that all of a sudden put him on the banks of them rice paddies in Vietnam. Somehow or another, that's where he, all of a sudden, that's where he's at. And the man just fell apart. Just went, come unglued. Mm -hmm. 
You could have told him all you wanted to. If you're here in a fuel bay of Little Rock, Arkansas, and he wouldn't know it. He, in his mind, he got a he got an AK-47. He's standing out there trying to kill something in a rice paddy. Stuff gets messed up inside of people. Hallelujah. Look at Luke chapter 4. I don't anything of the word today. Amen. When you approach people, you got to know when you're walking up to them. I mean, when they're coming towards you and you're going toward them, yeah. there's things inside them that you don't know anything about. You don't know what life's done to them. And just present them with the character of Christ every way you know how. Just some people are mad about Jesus, and you know they're not. Sometimes they just need to be shown sympathy. Some need to be shown compassion. Some need to be, some need to be, some need their chain jerked a little bit. You know, kind of get their attention. You just have to let the Holy Ghost lead you and how to approach people. But every one of them are hurting in some fashion because of what's happened in their lives. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, in my cup and book, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and set at liberty them that are bruised. Set at liberty those bruised reeds. Every little thing that comes to their life, they just fold up and fall apart because they're crushed on the inside. Hallelujah. <clears throat> we, we don't take the time to look it up because you all have seen it many times in Matthew 11. Chapter 11, verse 28, he said, Come to me, all you labor and heavy laden. I mean, that's everybody. Amen. He said, he said I didn't come to, you know, I said, I'm looking for the sick and the broken. He said, the, the, You know, not sick, don't need a physician. <clears throat> come to me that are heavy, you know, that are, that are, that are burdened and heavy laden. He said, I'll give you rest. Regardless of our past experiences, his love, his joy, his peace, God's Holy Spirit fixes everything. But that happens by invitation. One of the, one of the scenes on the video we just watched, and you've seen paintings of it in people's homes. You may have it in your own home, but he stands at the door and knocks. You can find it in Revelation chapter 3. I think it's or two maybe. But he stands at the door and knocks. He has a lot of good things for people, but he brings it and it's delivered and brought into mind in your life by invitation. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let me show you something that's interesting. Look at Mark chapter 15. We're, we're not, we don't like much wine in this up this morning. You don't get anything out of it? Mark chapter 15. Makes an interesting statement, I think. I don't know that you can say that reeds in the Bible across the board always represents people, but in the text that we've looked at, it does. Okay, <clears throat> Mark chapter 15, verse 16. <clears throat> the soldiers led Jesus away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. Verse 17, and they clothed Jesus with purple and planted a crown of thorns and put it about his head and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. They, you know, they're making fun of him. Look, look at verse 19. And they smote him on the head with a reed. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. And did spit upon him, bowing their knees and worshiped him in mockery. Verse 20, they're mocking him. But you put a reed in the hand of the master and that reed gets fixed. That reed will promote the master's mind. That reed will promote the character of the one that healed it. But you know what? You can take a reed and put it in the hand of the enemy. And he's really not interested in beating you on the elbow or the knee or the foot or somewhere else. He wants to hit you right across the top of the head and just inflict more anguish upon your soul. Yes. This reed in the enemy's hand here is designed to come right down across Jesus' head where those thorns are, just to create as much anguish of mind as can be created. Mm 
I mean, what is it? Why, why, when I find details in the Bible, when anybody finds details, you need to stop and look at it because there's something more being said there besides just a, you know, stick somebody's hand hitting Jesus. That reed represents people in the hand of the enemy, in the hand of Satan, under Satan's control. You've met a few of them, said hurtful words. Mm -hmm. Some of them have even physically attacked, you know, and bring brutal feelings and hurt and fears into people's lives. That's a reed in the hand of the enemy. Praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let's go back to the original text here in just a minute, Isaiah 42. Uh, if you find Isaiah 42 in Matthew 12, but we're going to just swap back and forth that to just a thought here for just a minute. But Isaiah 42 in Matthew 12. Because Jesus is quoting Isaiah 42 in Matthew 12. So if you just get those two open, we'll just read them again to refresh where we started from what we were doing in them. Isaiah 42, verse 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delights. Thank God God delighted in Jesus. Amen. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He didn't want to go and break the reed off where it's bruised, dead. He wanted to heal the bruise and make it strong. Yeah. Instead of just breaking it off where it's bruised, dead. He wanted to fix the bruise, fix the crush, Amen. and put strength back in the structure of it. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Jesus quoted that in Matthew chapter 12. Verse 20. <clears throat> a bruised reed shall he not break, a smoking flax shall he not quench till he sends forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Amen. Well, that's talking about me and you. Amen. Bless God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Smoking flax shall he not quench. Like we said earlier, that uh, flax is what they used, at least, well, I guess among other things, but at least this, the flax is used to make wicks for lamps, as we said. Put the oil in, stick the flax in there, and light the flax, and boy, you got a light in the house. A lamp is for light, but if light is well nigh gone out, you know some people that way. They're born again, got to church, was there for a little while, and after a while, sin and pressure and struggles and cares of life just took over until you, know, you haven't seen them in six months. I'm thinking of one particular individual, not and I were church with him, and, and, and we were praying, and it's our church that we were pastoring it. And boy, they just got born again. They danced all they danced all over the front of the church. I mean, they had a time. Today you'd have to go deep into the drug culture to find him. Mm -hmm. Because their light went out. They didn't keep the oil supplied. They didn't they didn't stay after the, 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 the leading of the Holy Spirit. If the light is well not going out, the smoke, the smoke, the messed up attitude, the crazy yeah, reaction that people have, that the devil's built into their life, the hurt that's in them. You know, they, 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 you, you, they, can't, they can't see how to walk themselves and, 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 and their attitude, you get around them and you can't see Jesus in their life. You can't see how to, you know, you have nothing to, to pattern your own walk after because they're so messed up. Hallelujah. But in the Lord's mind, rather than just throw the lamp out, in His mind, why don't we just put some new oil back in that same lamp and put a new piece of flax in there and refire that thing? Amen. It's what He did for everybody. That bowed their knee to Christ, brought their life to Him, put a glow on their face. Put some joy in their life. Hallelujah. Before I go any farther with that, we were in Mark 15 a while ago, and we were looking at this reed that had been used of the enemy. Let me show you something here. Uh, we're in Matthew, what, 12 right here? Look at Matthew 27. Let's just let me back, back up here and kind of recapture some thoughts I'm about to miss, but I'll go back to it right now. Matthew 27. 
verse 28. <clears throat> well, that's the text what we just read a while ago about where they smote him over the head with a reed. Okay, that's, that's a reed in the hand of the enemy. 2 Peter chapter 2. I don't like much, guys. I'm about done. Stay with me here for just a few minutes more. 2 Peter chapter 2. There are reeds that, that are in the devil's hands and uh, they're in people's homes, the workplace, wherever it is you are. The devil has his reeds there. But not only that, he has them in the church. 2 Peter chapter 2. If you found that, say amen. amen. Well, I'd say amen if I were there too, but hang on. All right, here we go. Uh, verse 9. You start at verse 9. read. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. My, my. That's a loaded verse. Lord. Verse 10. The chief of them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness. And despise government. Presumptions are, presumptions are the self will and are not afraid to speak evil of dignity. Verse 11. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not raiding accusation against them before the Lord. But 12. But these, look at your Bible, these as natural brute beasts are made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. As they that count it a pleasure to ride in the daytime, spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves uh, with their own deceiving while they feast with you. That's church. Yes. People in a church, they're feasting with you. Amen. There's people in churches that are just so full of brokenness and hurt. And they're given over to the work of the enemy. And people who are like that in churches, I mean, they'll sit there and amen. I was in the church service one time. Been, there's a lot of praise the Lord, glory to God. How big church. And there's a lot of praise the Lord going on. And there's this voice back here behind me. And well, I mean, it's hallelujah, praise the Lord. And all of a sudden, the most vulgar stuff started coming out of that. I mean, vulgarity. I mean, this horrible stuff coming out of that same individual. And there's a few minutes, praise the Lord, glory to God, coming out of that same person. It's full of the devil. In fact, I turned and looked. This person was standing up and her, there's a girl, young girl, her whole, her body made an S. Hmm. Yeah. I can understand that front to back. We're talking side to side. Her body made an S. Hmm. I was an usher. I thought, no, I'm going to get somebody else to usher. <laughs> <laughs> I went and got me three or four ushers. And, and they seen us coming. The girl said, boy, out the door she went. Yeah. And I left some of those guys the next day after when they ever caught her or not, I don't know. But she had a devil. Mm -hmm. But you put somebody like that in a church, and one minute it's praise the Lord, Lord God, and, 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 and when, like, before church and after church, where it's one on one, people communicate with one another, they just they bring a lot of hurt, a lot of hate yes, Lord. into people's lives. Well, what, what I'm trying to say is the devil has reeds in churches. Mm -hmm. Jude, you find a very similar, similar statement in, in, in this statement. A Jew. In fact, you almost get the idea that a Jew read Peter and quoted him. Jude chapter 1, verse 10. <clears throat> These speak evil of those things which they know not. But, they, and, but, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. You can go back over in the Old Testament and find that whole story. These are spots in your feast. Same, but same thing, you know, almost word for word what Peter said. Spots in your feast of charity. That's all we have to do. We're here in the name of Jesus. Amen. Loving one another every way we know how. Amen. Amen. Glorifying the Lord from our hearts the best we know how. Well, there's churches where these these, these people come in. Uh, they're reeds of the devil. And they come in to speak contempt to whoever will listen to them. Whenever they can. When they said they, these are spots in their feast of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves to, uh, without fear, clouds there without water, carried about a wind, trees without fruit wither, uh, wither without fruit twice dead. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. These are born again people who died spiritually the second time, right. twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Got rage going on, on the inside of them. The next verse. Mm -hmm. But their dogs that have returned to their vomit, selves to their wallowing. That's what it's talking about. 
Hallelujah. Let me just end this this morning with these thoughts. Jesus is saying, if you won't quit, if you won't quit trying, if you won't quit seeking Him, if you won't stop praying, if you won't stop believing, even in the midst of your hurt and your fears and your depression, He won't eat them. All of that stuff is designed to be a wedge to, drink, to come between you and Christ your Lord. But if you have your mind made up, he said, if I draw nigh to him, you'll draw nigh to me. Amen. I'm doing it through hurt, fear, pain, tears, depression, and the whole shooting match, rejection, and the whole ball of wax. I'm still going to draw nigh to him. He said he'd draw nigh to me. And the closer you get to him, Amen. it's like that crazy commercial. The closer you get, the better you look. Or they look or something. I don't know. The closer you get to Jesus, the better he looks. Isn't that right? Amen. If you won't quit, he won't. One of the craziest things about rejection and the crazy thing about a, about a bruised spirit. That, that actually has to be loved out of people. You have to love Amen. them. Because it hurts worse to turn it loose than it does to keep it. Yeah. You just have to love it out of people. It creates a problem of its own. People don't want to stand still long enough for you to love it out of them. So you have to be diligent to keep them covered in prayer and try to get as close to people as you can when you get in their presence, just love them. Amen. Amen. Don't you think of this today? Amen. Let's go. Praise the Lord. Those of you viewing by the internet or the DVD. Praise the Lord. Pain is yours to keep if you want, but you can get rid of it if you like. Just let Jesus Lord. into your life. He doesn't care how sorry and sick you messed up. He doesn't care. The Lord does not care how bad you sinned. It doesn't make any difference. I don't care if you're the president of the Chainsaw Massacre Club. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. how sick and sorry your life is. just doesn't matter. If you'll just bow your heart and soul to the living Christ and invite Him into your life, the Spirit of the Almighty God will come into your life and fix all your brokenness. Mm -hmm. And what doesn't get fixed right then will get if you'll make a decision to follow Him. Amen. Be faithful to a church. Be faithful to a pastor. Be faithful to the Word of God. Be faithful to pray and to study. Just be faithful to Christ. What's all messed up will get fixed. He'll get fixed after a while. And it's the simplest thing in the world to get this started. All you have to do is just say, I'm a sinner and want to be saved. You know, you know who you are. You're a sinner and want to be saved. You don't need nobody to tell you that. But the Lord wants to hear you, to, he wants to hear you say it. Confess that's who you are. Because that's what we, you know, we all were sinners when we come to the Lord. Mm -hmm. But if you'll confess that to him, he said, I'll give you my, he said he'll give you his righteousness. He'll take your old sin stuff and give you his righteousness and make a new creature out of you. Amen. Amen. It's called being born again. Amen. His character comes in. His acceptance comes in. We've been made to be accepted in the beloved. You can read it in the New Testament. Just believe in your heart and confess Him with your mouth that, that, that He's your Lord and your Savior and tell somebody you did. The Bible says you believe that He died and rose from the dead. If you believe that, and tell somebody you did because whoever you, Jesus said if you confess Him before men, He would confess you before the Father. All that has to be done. You have to, you have to, be, you have to, you have to, you have to confess Him. He said if you do that, be saved. You shall be saved. Hallelujah. Listen, hell's real. Amen. And so is heaven. And that choice is ours today. That choice is yours. You can live with your hurt, your tears, and your pain and rejection until you die. That's what you want. But you can get rid of it in about 60 seconds. Praise the Lord. The choice is yours. Well, listen, do that today. Don't put it off. Until next time, God bless. Amen. Amen.